Right. So let's talk about a couple of uh, conditions uh, which are associated with the angle of inclination of uh, the femur. And um, these two conditions are known as the coxa vera and the coxa valga. Now, uh, vera is a term, it's a Latin term which indicates a deformity in which the distal seg uh, segment deviates towards the midline. So, uh, the distal segment, which would be this segment, it uh, deviates towards the midline so uh, in other words the angle of inclination which is between the neck and the shaft of the femur it decreases and um, the angle becomes more acute and usually is less than 120 degrees it could be congenital which meaning it could be at uh, birth uh, it could be developmental uh, and that usually goes uh, unnoticed uh, it could be acquired for example in uh, rickets. On the other extreme, you have uh, a condition known as the coxa valga. Now, uh, as you can see here, in this condition, the angle of inclination increases much more than um, the average of 126 degrees. And um, valga is a Latin term which indicates a deformity in which the distal element moves away from the midline. So, uh, in coxa valga, the angle of inclination is usually more than 135 degrees. So, this angle becomes much greater. And it could be uh, because of some developmental delays. It could be associated uh, in conditions with developmental delays, for example, uh, in cerebral palsy. Uh, it could be uh, because of the con in, in uh, congenital dislocation of the hip. Now, uh, what happens in coxa valga is that the adduction of hip is uh, limited and in case of coxa vera the abduction of hip joint is limited now let's talk about uh, the various fractures of femur uh, fractures of femurs uh, femur could be uh, of the neck of the femur or usually they are of the shaft of the femur so when it comes to the fractures of neck of femur uh, they usually of uh, two types um, they could be subcapital fractures so a subcapital fracture would be this one. This uh, fracture occurs at the junction of the head of the femur with the neck of the femur. And a subcapital fracture is an intracapsular fracture. Now um, the fracture line extends through the junction of the head and neck of femur. Uh, it is much more common in the elderly. It usually occurs due to just a small stumble or just a little fall. And it is much more common in, uh, in women, in the elderly women. Uh, because of the osteoporotic uh, osteoporotic changes uh, that take place in uh, postmenopausal women uh, due to the decreased levels of estrogen. Now, uh, in the subcapital fracture, uh, this fracture is um, very commonly associated with avascular necrosis of the head of femur. Um, why? Because um, the most of the blood supply to the head of the femur is uh, coming from this side from the neck of the femur and mainly it's the medial circumflex femoral artery and branches from that then um, provide blood to the head of the femur as well and uh, the uh, blood which is coming from this side through the uh, ligamentum teres is not sufficient to uh, maintain blood supply to the head of the femur and as a result of uh, the fracture which is associated with this disruption of uh, blood to the head of the femur avascular necrosis of the head of the femur uh, results. Now, um, other than the avascular necrosis, the other changes are uh, that uh, strong muscles of the thigh pull the distal fragment upwards, right? So the distal fragment would be uh, pulled upwards and that would lead to shortening of uh, the limb. Uh, and um, these muscles are usually the rectus femoris, uh, the adductor muscles in the anterior uh, thigh and the posterior compartment, the hamstring muscles in the posterior compartment. Um, other than that, uh, the distal fragment is also pulled laterally because of the lateral rotators of the thigh. And these lateral rotators include the gluteus maximus, uh, the two gemelli, the obturator internus and uh, the uh, quadratus femoris muscle. So usually a person uh, with, a, um, with a fracture uh, has uh, his toes, uh, instead of pointing forwards, uh, these toes 
uh, point outwards because of lateral rotation of the distal fragment of uh, the femur. So this diagram here shows that in case of uh, the fracture, the distal fragment, this one here, it is pulled upwards by uh, the strong uh, muscles and um, the distal fragment is also uh, rotated laterally and as a result the this is the normal unaffected foot and on the side of the fracture the toes point outwards because of the lateral rotation of the uh, distal fragment of uh, the femur after the subcapital uh, fractures we move on to the trochanteric fractures uh, these uh, fractures usually occur um, in the young or the middle-aged uh, individuals and occur as a result of direct trauma. Uh, the fracture line is intracapsular when it comes to the subcapital fractures. But in case of these trochanteric fractures, the fracture line is extracapsular. And uh, as a result, both the fragments, the proximal and the distal fragment, would have a profuse blood supply. So this type of a fracture is not associated usually with uh, avascular necrosis of the head of femur, although there is shortening and lateral rotation of the leg, just like in the subcapital fractures. Then we move on to the shaft, the fractures of the shaft of the femur. Uh, these are also usually more common in uh, young healthy individuals as a result of uh, some sort of trauma. And uh, we can divide these fractures into, uh, depending on the site of the fracture, it could be uh, a fracture of the proximal third of the femur, a fracture of the middle third of the femur and a fracture uh, of the distal third of the femur. Now when it comes to uh, the fracture of uh, the uh, proximal third of the femur, um, the proximal fragment it becomes flexed uh, because of uh, the pull of the iliopsoas muscle. Uh, it is abducted because of the gluteus medius and minimus muscles and it is laterally rotated because of the lateral rotators which we talked about just now the gluteus maximus the piriformis the obturator internus the chimeli and the quadratus femoris uh, and the distal fragment is adducted by adductor muscles it is pulled upwards because of the strong hamstrings and the quadriceps muscles and laterally rotated by uh, the adductors as well as by the weight of the foot uh, after that, we move on to the fracture of the middle third of the shaft of the uh, femur. And um, in this case, the distal fragment again is pulled. So this would be the distal fragment. And this is then pulled upwards uh, by uh, uh, the, dis uh, the hamstrings and the quadriceps. And uh, in this case, there is considerable shortening of the leg. Uh, the distal fragment is also uh, rotated posteriorly it's also pulled posteriorly due to the um, uh, the uh, gastrocnemius muscle now the gastrocnemius muscle uh, is a muscle of the calf and the two heads it has two heads a medial head and a lateral head these are attached uh, on the posterior aspect of uh, the um, the supracondylar ridges both the medial and the lateral uh, supracondylar ridges have the uh, origin of the head of the gastric nemia. So once uh, the fracture line is passing through the middle third of uh, the shaft and uh, you have a proximal and a distal segment fragment, um, what's going to happen is that uh, the two heads of the gastric nemia muscle uh, pull on uh, this distal fragment and pull it posteriorly or backwards. Uh, the third scenario is that the uh, fracture line is passing through the distal third of the uh, shaft of the femur. Now in this case, uh, the, all the effects on the proximal part would be uh, uh, the same. But uh, the distal fragment is much smaller and um, this would be rotated backwards uh, to a much greater degree by the gastrocnemius muscle. Now as a result of this uh, backwards pull, there's going to be um, possibly a pressure on uh, the popliteal artery right and this can then interfere with uh, blood supply to the leg and the foot